right, well, we are getting to the end of the Gospel of Luke. Anybody know how many chapters are left? Anybody look it up? Two. Two and a half. We're like halfway through 22, so there's two more beyond that, yeah. We've got two and a half chapters left. We've gone through 22 chapters already. And we've covered a lot of ground, right? We've talked about all sorts of different things, of different discussions Jesus had, different debates he had, different miracles he's done, different people that have followed him, different people that have opposed him, all sorts of craziness in his story, and all sorts of teachable moments he's had with his disciples. And we're finally getting through three years of his ministry to this kind of climax of his story, the whole thing he's been working towards, everything he's been talking about, pointing towards, working towards, uh, is getting near. He just finished having this Passover meal with his disciples, and he told them there that this was the last meal he's going to share with them. It's his last teachable moment with them, and it didn't end well, right? When we got to the end of it, we saw Jesus, first he reshaped the Passover. He took it from this Old Testament uh, celebration that they had where they focused on the time that God saved them from Egypt, and he said, now this is a new Passover, basically. I'm the new sacrificial lamb. I'm going to be the final sacrifice, and my sacrifice will be for all the sins of the world for now and forever. And so he tells them that. He says, this is where I'm headed. This is what's going to happen. My body is like this bread that is going to be broken. My blood is like this juice that is poured out. All of this stuff is going to happen so that my mission can be fulfilled in the world. And he tells them that. And then he teaches them. Because they get a little bit distracted. First they get upset because one of them is going to betray them. And then they suddenly change to fighting over who's the greatest. Because the disciples just tend to miss the point quite often. And so he gets to this, he says, no, in order to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you have to become the least. And then he says, here's how you're going to do it. Here's how you're going to prepare physically and spiritually. And he does this thing about taking up your sword. The disciples take it literally, right? They go, oh, we've got two swords. You said we need one, we've got two. God, look, we're over-prepared. Isn't this awesome? They hold up two weapons of war, and God, Jesus says, no. It's not what I was talking about. And he says, all right. We're out of time for this conversation. That's enough. It's time to go pray. And so the Passover meal marks the beginning of the end of Jesus' ministry. He will no longer have the freedom to travel around and teach in different cities and in synagogues. He'll no longer be able to perform miracles for huge crowds, and his teachable moments with his disciples are done. All that's left is for Jesus to do exactly what he said his end goal was. Everything he's been teaching and speaking about for the last three years, that's all that's left. This journey to the cross. And so with the end in sight, as he knows his death is only hours away, he does the only thing that we can really do in times that seem hopeless or overwhelming. He goes and he prays. And as we turn to Luke chapter 2, we're going to see Jesus' prayer at the Mount of Olives. And this particular story actually shows up in both Matthew and Mark as well. But those two authors highlight different significant points of this event than Luke does. You see, in Matthew and Mark, they highlight the significance of Jesus praying that God would find another way, another option, something else that could fulfill God's purpose without Jesus having to go through this. He says, God, will you take this away if possible? I don't want to do this, but... If I have to, I will. And they highlight that. And the other thing they highlight is the disciples and their inability to stay awake. Jesus comes to them and says, hey, stay awake, stay watch, keep watch. He goes to pray, they fall asleep. He comes back, hey, keep watch. He goes to pray, they fall asleep. And the story ends in the other Gospels with Jesus telling them it's too late. Too late for you guys to keep watch because now those who have come to arrest him are here. Time's up. That's Matthew and Mark. That's what they focus on in the story. But what's fascinating about the story in Luke's gospel is that he doesn't place as much emphasis on those particular things. They're still there. If you read it, you'll hear the same, he'll say some of the similar things. But because Luke is writing to the second generation Christians, Christians who are facing very similar situations to what Jesus was facing at the time, who are, who are suffering horrible persecution and who are being put to death for their faith, he places more emphasis on how Jesus handled his own persecution. 
focuses on how Jesus handled what he's about to go through. Because what Jesus went through is what Luke's audience is going through at that time. And so as we turn to Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 39, verse 39 we're going to look at how, Jesus, how Luke presents these last moments of Jesus' freedom. And then we're going to look at what happens after Jesus finishes praying. So turn with me to Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 53, as we look at Jesus' prayer at the Mount of Olives and the arrest that follows. So Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. And then he withdrew a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, Jesus prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood flowing, falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to his disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray that you will not fall into temptation. And while he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guards, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your honor when darkness reigns. This is the word of the Lord. So we find Jesus leaving the Passover feast leaving this conversation he had with his disciples where they once again missed the point of what he was trying to say. And they brought out their swords, ready to go to war. And we see Jesus make his way to the Mount of Olives to pray, being followed by his disciples. And what we learn is that this is a normal occurrence for Jesus. It's a place where Jesus often withdrew to pray, and also a place where he would go with his disciples to kind of regroup and debrief and to teach them without the presence of all these large crowds that have been around them all the time. Which means that the disciples kind of had an idea of what they expected at this location. What they probably expected when they got there was that Jesus, in the frustration that he showed with the two swords in, during the last lesson, they think Jesus is going to take them there to have a private meeting, To have another teachable moment, to have a time where Jesus tries to correct their understanding and reshape their thinking. This is what they've done before, right? They get together with Jesus. He rehashes what they've been doing, what they've experienced. They talk about it. He teaches them. He corrects their understanding. This is what the minds of the disciples think is going to happen. And so they go out to the Mount of Olives with Jesus, not really too worried. Maybe a little bit concerned that they're going to get you know, called out for their behavior, but they're not really worried about what's going to happen afterwards. However, instead of the usual routine they expect, Jesus tells them to start praying. He doesn't go into a lesson. He doesn't turn this into a teachable moment. He doesn't do any miracles or big signs or anything to get their attention. Instead, they are called to stay where they are and to pray that they don't fall into temptation. And with that very simple but significant instruction, Jesus leaves them and goes to pray a little distance away. And as Jesus kneels down to pray, he cries out to God, asking God, is there any other option? Jesus asks, is there any other way that he doesn't have to bear the cup he knows he's about to bear? But even as he prays this prayer, he commits to doing whatever God decides is needed to be done. Jesus chooses to trust God and to follow God's will no matter what that means for him. Or no matter how much he's going to suffer because of that result. And when Jesus prays that prayer, not my will but yours, God, be done. God sends an angel to Jesus, 
Send someone to strengthen him so that he can endure that journey to the cross. God equips him with everything he needs to do what he is called to do. Gives him the power and the encouragement and the strength to face what he's about to face. And so as God sends the angels, God helps strengthen him as he prepares Jesus for this journey to the cross. Jesus continues to pray. He continues to seek God's will and to continue to seek God's power in his life and to continue to pray that God's will be done. And as the reality of what he's about to face becomes more and more intense, Jesus prays more and more intensely. He becomes more aware of just how significant what he's about to do is, and he prays all the more because of it. In fact, this whole experience becomes so stressful that Jesus actually develops a condition that has now been called hematosohydrosis. Say that five times fast. Hematohydrosis. There we go. Which is a condition where you, your sweat actually becomes blood. It's this condition that can occur in the body where your body is under so much stress that the blood vessels that surround the sweat glands actually erupt. And the blood mixes with your sweat and then pours out of your body. It takes a very high level of stress for this to occur. It's not a very common thing to happen. That shows just how much stress Jesus' body is under as he prays and prepares for what happens next. He knows what he is about to go through. He knows the pain and brokenness and sinfulness he's about to bring on himself for the sake of the world. And this knowledge, this anticipation, this foreshadowing of what's going to happen puts so much stress on Jesus' body that he sweats blood as he prays. And yet despite all of that, Jesus continues to pray. He continues to remain faithful to God. He continues to press on and endure because he knows what his end goal is. He knows why he was brought down to earth. He knows what he's there for and what he will accomplish when he's he's finished with it. So he prays and he prepares to face the cross. And finally, sometime later, we don't know how long, but it's been a while, Jesus' prayer concludes. And he gets up and he goes to find the disciples he left telling them to pray. Now remember, Jesus had suffered such extreme pressure that his body reflected the strain. And he's about to give up everything for the sake of the world, and all he asks of his disciples is, during this time is to pray so that they don't fall into temptation. Right? He's facing death, and a very gruesome one at that, and all he's asked his disciples to do is pray. They don't even understand the full magnitude, just, just pray. And yet as Jesus approaches them, he finds that not only are they not praying, they've fallen asleep. They've done the exact opposite of what Jesus had told them to do. Now I want you to make sure you look closely at the text because many people will read this, and I did this the first time through too, I missed this phrase. And we assume the disciples are simply tired. Right? They've drifted off. It's been a long day. They had this big celebration for the Passover. Jesus had said a lot of upsetting things during his last teaching. It makes sense that they're exhausted. Right? A lot has happened in the last 24 hours. But that's not what Luke says is the reason for their slumber. It's not because they're exhausted or wiped out or too much has happened. It says instead... In verse 45, that they fell asleep because of their sorrow. They are feeling a lot of those extreme emotions that Jesus was feeling. They are finally starting to grasp the magnitude of what is about to happen to their leader and their friend. And they're so overwhelmed with grief that they just can't take it anymore. They can't bear any more grief, and so they go to sleep instead. They just give up. They go to sleep. They don't want to focus on it anymore. And here's where we see just how wide the gap still is between Jesus and his disciples. While Jesus was faced with this extreme situation, he prayed all the more earnestly. He came to God with everything he was feeling and needing and thinking. He went to God in prayer. While the disciples simply gave up and did what they could to stop feeling at all. And so Jesus finds them sleeping and he wakes them up and once again he says, Pray so that you won't enter temptation. Pray that you won't enter temptation. He knows he's not going to be there to correct them anymore. And he knows there's going to be a very real temptation to flee, to reject Christ, to give up on everything Jesus has been teaching because there's going to be some real dangers for them. Pray that you won't enter temptation. But as Jesus is warning them to pray, this large group just suddenly comes up and starts surrounding them. And there in the lead is Judas, one of the twelve. 
One who knew about Jesus' habit of going to the Mount of Olives. One who knew exactly where Jesus would be to teach and to pray because he had been there with them. He had gone to the Mount of Olives to learn, to be taught, to experience and debrief everything that had been going on. He had been there with Jesus. And so he brings the group. And he approaches Jesus to give him a kiss of greeting. This kiss of greeting is a sign of friendship, of closeness, of intimacy. And he uses this as a sign of of betrayal. He takes that friendship and all those years together and he betrays Jesus. He takes an action meant to portray intimate friendship and he uses it to betray Jesus as a signal to the hostile crowd of who they should arrest. And Jesus calls him out on it and says, Really, Judas? Really? You are where you're betraying me. Are you really going to feign friendship while you do it? And that act of betrayal makes it so much worse. Right? If you think about it, which hurts more? Being hurt by a stranger or by someone who's supposed to be close to you? The worst, when someone you don't know hurts you or when a loved one stabs you in the back. It hurts so much worse when someone we love and trust, someone we expect a sense of loyalty from, betrays us. It hurts more than when someone we don't know harms us in any way. And that's what Judas does. He shows just how close of a friend he was to Jesus, while also metaphorically driving a stake through his back. He uses a sign of friendship to trade him. And as all this is going on, as Judas gets ready to turn Jesus over, the other disciples start to pick up on what's going on. Right? They've heard Jesus say what's going to happen, they've heard him talk about his death, and they start to finally get, okay, whatever Jesus has been talking about, we're about to see happen. Jesus told them he's going to be arrested, and when he is, he's going to be killed. And they see Jesus' teachings play out in real time. So they go to Jesus and say, what should we do? We've got our swords, because <laughs> they didn't learn their lesson the first time. How can we avoid this horrible fate that Jesus has already told them is going to happen? How can we avoid, Jesus, you being arrested? What should we do? Should we take out our swords and go to war? To pull out their swords. The ones that they just presented Jesus with a few moments ago few hours ago where Jesus became so frustrated with their lack of understanding that he just ended the conversation and went to pray. Those same swords, they bring him out, proving just how much they don't understand. The disciples know what Jesus told them. They heard how it needs to happen in order for Jesus to fulfill his purpose on earth. And they've been told countless times that God's kingdom is not one where, wage, where they will rage war against earthly kingdoms. And yet the very thing Jesus told them would happen does. The people show up He's betrayed by one of his twelve. They come to arrest him. Exactly as Jesus said it would happen. And what do they do? They pull out their swords and ask Jesus if they should attack. They don't. Get it. And one of them doesn't even wait for Jesus to respond. Right? He pulls out his sword and he just starts swinging. And as he does, he ends up cutting off the ear of one of the servants of the high priest that's there in the crowd. Just goes to war. Doesn't take into consideration anything Jesus has said. Doesn't even wait for him to respond. He just goes. But before an all-out war can begin, between the rash disciples and the crowd there to arrest Jesus, Jesus once again tells his disciples just knock him. To stop trying to fight a spiritual battle with physical weapons. Not only does he end the bloodbath before it can begin, but in true Jesus fashion, he stops the war and he heals the man who's there intending to do harm to Jesus. He stops his disciples from attacking, and he heals the man whose ear has been cut off. He was the complete opposite of what the disciples wanted him to do. And after healing the man, Jesus turns to the rest of the crowd, this group filled with the chief priests, the officers of the temple, and all of these religious leaders. It's a group of people who should have been the first to recognize the Messiah. These leaders were tasked with speaking to the people on God's behalf, they're the heads of Israel's religion who know the scriptures inside and out. They should have known who Jesus was and what he was there to do, and they have failed to see what's right in front of them. Jesus turns to these people, these religious leaders who should have known better, and he calls them out. He says, what are you doing? Why are you acting like I'm trying to lead some big re rebellion? Why do you think I'm trying to go to war and create all these problems? Why are you treating me like a criminal? 
Like someone that you have to get in front of to stop with brute force because you're afraid of what I'm going to do. Why do you have to create this angry mob? Stop me. What he's really asking is that, why did you do it now? Right? He says, I've been in the temple every day. I've been standing next to you every week teaching people. I have had crowds around me that you could have easily found me. I wasn't hiding. Right? He says, I've been there. You knew exactly where I was this entire time. So why now? Why are you coming to me now? Why have you brought this huge group of people with all of these weapons to stop me now? So Jesus calls them out on it. He says, never once has he been aggressive or violent. And he questions why they think he's going to change that now. Never once has he advocated for any sort of aggression. You know, they're treating him like this big war criminal. So what Jesus is really saying is that he knows that the religious leaders know that if they were to arrest Jesus in public, the religious leaders would have been the ones to face the backlash. And they've already tried to confront Jesus. They've already tried to challenge Jesus. They've already tried to trip him up multiple times. And each time they came out the losers. Because Jesus, the one who has all the answers, and they can't figure that out. And so Jesus knows, and the religious leaders know, that if they came to him and tried to arrest him in front of all these crowds that he has healed and taught and performed miracles in front of, then Jesus isn't going to be the one that the crowds hate in that moment. But their goal is to get rid of Jesus. They don't care how they do it or what they have to do. Their goal is to get rid of Jesus, no matter who he is or how much he's liked by the crowds. And so they have to perform these shady and underhanded tasks to complete their goal. They can't arrest him in public. They have to do it when no one else will see. They have to do it in the cover of darkness. They bribe one of Jesus' friends to betray him. They gather a large crowd with lots of weapons. And they make their move under the cover of darkness where Jesus' supporters can't bear witness to their actions. They're so caught up in getting rid of Jesus that they have to become these dark, sinful, broken, evil people to do it. And Jesus knows all this. And yet, when they go to arrest him, Jesus simply goes with them willingly, without so much as a hint of a fight or protest, because Jesus knows this is why he's on earth. This is what he has come to accomplish, and this is the next step towards his ultimate goal. Now, I said at the beginning that Luke's focus on this passage is a bit different from Mark and Matthew's because he is writing to a group of people who are suffering in similar ways to how Jesus suffered. Luke's audience has witnessed loved ones and friends be tortured and murdered for their faith in Christ. And Luke is showing through this passage how they are to respond in the face of adversity. How are they are supposed to approach all of those people who are trying to persecute them? How they're supposed to handle the harm people they should have trusted are giving. And so I think it's important to understand that we need this in our lives as well. Hopefully none of us ever have to face the kind of persecution that Jesus or Luke's audience had to go through. But there are plenty of hard times that we face today. And the same teachings we learn from Jesus in today's passage apply to our hardships just as they apply to those who read Luke's gospel for the first time. And so we're going to look at three things that Jesus teaches us to do when faced with the brokenness and hurtfulness and pain of our sinful world. When we are presented with something that isn't fair, when a friend betrays us, when we suffer because of our desire to live counterculturally, these are the things Jesus calls us to do. And the first thing Jesus says is to pray so that you may not be tempted. The first thing we must always do when faced with anything, both good and bad, is to pray. Throughout Jesus' ministry, we find him constantly retreating and going off to quiet places to pray. He teaches on several occasions on the importance of prayer, and when Jesus was faced with the harshest reality of his mission on earth, he went to God in earnest prayer. And this is what we're called to do, too. Anytime we're faced with something that hurts, go to God in prayer. Anytime we're tempted to do something we know we shouldn't, we're to go to God in prayer. Whenever we want to choose selfish choices rather than live counterculturally, we go to God in prayer. Whenever we see a loved one making poor choices and we don't know how to help them, we go to God in prayer. When we see people in need but we don't know how to reach them or how to lift them up out of their situation, we go to God in prayer. Our first response should always 
be prayer. Our last resort, when all else fails and our situation seems hopeless, should be prayer. And all the times in between, between the beginning and the end, we should be practicing active lives of prayer. And it's not because God gets lonely and he needs us to constantly talk to him. Right? God isn't some needy friend who has to have our attention to feel good about himself. It's not what God needs and it's not what Jesus is saying. No, what Jesus knows is that God is the only one who can reach us in our hopeless situations and offer us hope. And so Jesus is saying to be constant in the constant relationship with God through prayer so that we never lose sight of that hope. That we never lose sight of who we are called to be. Prayer is how we stay in a relationship with God, and we should, be, we should want to constantly be engaged in that relationship. However, a prayer life can't be some sort of Aladdin movie, right? God isn't some genie that we pull out anytime we need saving or forgiveness or we want to pass a test in school or something, right? It's not a way to get what we need, and then we pack God back into the lamp and wait until we need to rub it, the lamp again and have him come back out. Right? He's not some genie who just shows up to give us what we want. It's not what prayer is supposed to be, but that's often what we use prayer as, right? We go to, in prayer and we list all of our requests, treat it like our letter to Santa, and then we go on up our way. That's not the kind of prayer Jesus is talking about, right? This is prayer that he engaged in when faced with the most difficult time in his life. Instead, when we pray, our attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. An attitude where he said, not my will, but yours, God, be done. When we pray, we should absolutely repent of our sins. We should seek forgiveness for the poor choices we made. We can absolutely even ask God for things and help with situations. God wants to know what's going on in our lives. He wants to be asked for things that we need. I'm not saying don't do that. But at the end of it, after we've laid our requests at God's feet, after we've said everything we needed to say, we need to be willing to say, finally, that what I want is what you want, God. You say, this is how I feel, this is how I hope to handle the situation, this is how I wish things were, this is what I hope to gain, this is what will make my life easier or make the situation better. But, if you have a different plan, God, change my heart so that I will align with your plan. If you think I need to do something differently, if you think I need to see something differently, if you think I need to act with people differently, then show me that, God. Tell me, God, what your will is, because I don't want to get what I want if it comes at the expense of going against what you want, God. This is how we must approach prayer, with the understanding that God knows best. God understands your situation better than you do, and God sees beyond your immediate circumstances to a future filled with hope and healing and restoration. And because that is the God we serve, we need to be willing to lay down all of our wants, all of our desires, all the things that we think are fair or right for us, and be willing to live into the reality of God's will, not ours. And so when we face, we're faced with persecution, when confronted with the brokenness and sinfulness of our world, we see through Christ's example that we need to live a life of prayer. And not just prayer for the sake of praying, not just to list out things or to check it off of a list to be a good Christian, but one in which we truly live into the desire of God's will above our own. But there's one thing that Jesus did during all of this that we also need to remember to do as we navigate who we are supposed to be as we live out God's will in our lives. And that's in seeing Jesus' interaction with the high priest servant. Right, where Jesus looked at the man who came to arrest him, a man who was there to assist in getting rid of him, who was there to try to get Jesus killed, instead of leaving him to suffer, looking at him with his ear bleeding, Jesus reached out and he healed him. Jesus took care of a man who wanted nothing but suffering for Jesus. He showed love to someone who wanted to actively harm him. And in this example, we are reminded that while, yes, we are going to suffer, yes, we're going to face hard times, yes, we are going to be betrayed and hurt by people we love and trust, in all of those times, we are still called to respond in love. Jesus shows us that we are to love those who persecute you. Out of everything we're called to do, Everything we've talked about, everything Jesus taught us, this is probably one of the hardest. While it may seem difficult to give up your selfish desires, to care for the poor and the lonely, while it may go against our immediate reaction to lower ourselves and serve rather than to be served, all these things still kind of make sense. We understand them. 
pretty regularly. We may not want to do them, but we understand. We see how we should care for those in need around us. But what often doesn't make sense to us is this calling to love those who persecute us. To care for those who betray us. To seek to lift up those who only want to knock us down. At the very least, in these situations, we want to do what the disciples did. Right? We want to step away. We want to go to sleep. We want to forget about it and ignore that it was even happening. We want to bury our heads in the sand and forget about all those people and what they did to us. We don't think about it. We think that's how we're loving them. We just forget they've existed. And at the very worst, and the more common reaction, we want to do to them what they did to us. We want to make them feel the same way they felt, that they made us feel when they betrayed us. It's our knee-jerk reaction when someone persecutes us, and yet Jesus, when faced with the ultimate betrayal and persecution, when rejected and harmed by one of his closest friends, and faced with tons of people who wanted to kill him, he chose to take care of the one who opposed him. He chose to heal the one who wanted to harm him. And this is who we are called to be to. We are called to live in such a way that we show God's love, not only to the least of these, not only to the outcasts and the lowly, but also those who we least want to show love to. And so as we close today, we're going to spend a few minutes practicing a prayer lifestyle. We're going to take a few minutes to sit quietly in prayer, and I'm going to encourage each of you, as you sit there quietly, either in your chairs or even if you want to kneel on the floor, I want you to take this time to have a prayerful conversation with God. I want you to ask him to strengthen your prayer life, to remind you to come to God with all the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life. To make your life a prayerful life where you pray at the beginning of something, in the middle of something, and at the end of something. Where every moment is a prayer moment, where God is right there in relationship with you as you go throughout your day. Then as you pray, I want you to pray that the Holy Spirit will also equip you to reveal to you what God's will is in your life. And to empower you to live into that will, even if it goes against what you wish was going on. Even if God is calling you to do something you don't really want to do, or he's saying no to something you really want. Pray that the Holy Spirit will empower you to live into God's will. And finally, I want to encourage you to ask Jesus to reveal to you someone who has hurt you that you need to go out and show love to probably going to be the hardest part of this exercise, but I want you to ask Christ to reveal a name or even a face to you as you pray. Someone that you need to go out and actively love. Actively be the hand and feet of Jesus to. Someone you don't want to do that for, but that God's calling you to love anyways. So I'm going to invite you to join me and spend a few minutes at the feet of Jesus, practicing this prayer-filled life that Jesus called us to. Lord Jesus, I just want to invite you into our lives. Not just 
when we need something or when we want to thank you for something that you've blessed us with, but as every part of our day, Lord, we just encourage, we just invite you to help us as we go about our day that it's always with you by our side. That we live prayerful lives where every moment is an act of relationship with you. That we seek you in the good times, the bad times, and the really ugly times, Lord. That you are our first response. When we don't know what to do, when we don't know how to behave, when we don't know what to say, that instead of getting worried or anxious or burying our head in the sand, that our first response is to turn to you, Lord. We pray that you would help us be those people, Lord. We pray as you reveal to us exactly what that looks like, exactly what your plan is for us, and all the changes we might have to make or the things we have to say no to, we pray that you would help empower us, give us strength to follow your will even when it's not ours. Change our hearts so that our hearts reflect your heart, Lord. Reveal to us what needs to change, what needs to be addressed, what needs to be dealt with, so that we can truly live into your calling in our, in our lives, Lord. And we especially want to take time to pray the difficult prayer of help me love those who have harmed me. We look at your example, Lord, your willingness to heal the man there to harm, who was there to harm you. We look at that example and we want to be those people, Lord, but we realize that's not an easy, easy task to do. Our first response is normally to lash out, strike back, harm them too. And we pray that when we feel the response, when we're faced with someone who's hurt us or someone that we feel deserves punishment in that way, Lord, we pray that you would bring your love pouring out of us. Change our hearts to reflect the love that you have for each one of us. And let us reflect that to those around us, regardless of how they've treated us or how they'll treat us in the future, Lord. Help us to be your hands and feet to a broken, sinful, hurting world. Help us be examples of the hope that you provide us. We love you so much, Lord. We thank you so much for the sacrifice you made that we're focusing on right now and how that's changed our hearts and our lives already. We just pray that you continue to work in our lives. Lord. We love you. Amen. I hope each of you makes this a habit of your daily lives, that as you go from this building into your work, your homes, your friends, your family, your schools, that you would approach all things first with prayer and a desire to do God's will. And so as we close, I want to invite you to stand and receive this benediction from Hebrews chapter 13. And as you stand, I want to remind you that we approach these benedictions with open hands as we hear the word of God as this symbol showing that we understand that on our own, we're like these empty hands. We don't have enough to do what we're called to do, but we also know that God is there to give us all we need to do his will. And so we open our hands asking to receive what God has for us so we can live into the calling he's placed in our lives. To receive this benediction with me, it says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory ever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.